Good morning, Ascent. Welcome. Would you go ahead and take a seat? And as you do, I just want to wish you a happy Memorial Day weekend. We want to take a minute just to honor and recognize those who have lost their lives bravely serving our country. We are so grateful for their priceless sacrifice. Uh, this is a weekend where we know so many people travel, and so we are so glad that you chose to be with us here today, whether you're here in person or you're um, with us online today, we're glad that you hear, you're here. If we haven't had a chance to meet yet, my name is Kaylee, and I am our kids and families pastor here at Ascent. I brought some of my friends with me down here. Maybe you've noticed them. <laughs> Yes, awesome. We've got K through fifth in the room today. We're so excited just for a little bit. Um, but we're so glad that you're here. If you're new to Ascent, welcome. Um, we would love to meet you. We'd love to connect with you. So we'd love to invite you after service to join us in our connection center. You can come and meet John or Molly, or you can scan that QR code on the back of the chair that's right in front of you. That will give um, you a chance to connect with us, fill out our connection card. And this is a way that we can access our weekly email, and you can find out what is happening here at Ascent. So, speaking of things happening here at Ascent, perhaps you've noticed this large tub on the floor this morning. Do you know what that means? Ascent. This means that there is joy in the house of the Lord today because we get to celebrate a baptism. And I am so excited about this one in particular because we get to celebrate with an awesome eight-year-old. So, we're going to celebrate, but before we do the baptism, I need you to know two things. Number one, baptism is a way that we show and tell others about the faith that we have in Jesus, that we've made a personal decision to trust Jesus as our Lord and Savior. And the second thing that I need you to know is that here at Ascent, we celebrate baptisms. We celebrate baptisms. Why? Because we believe that when you put your faith and your trust in Jesus, it changes your life. We believe that Jesus is life and light and hope and love. He brings us peace and healing and joy. We believe that Jesus is good. And that's why we at Ascent want to exist for the good of our city. We want all of our neighbors to know about the love that Jesus has for them and to understand what he has done for them. So when someone makes the decision to put their faith and their trust in Jesus, we celebrate. So today... Ascent, are you ready to celebrate life change and a baptism today? Okay, pretty good, pretty good. This is your job today is to help us celebrate. And I brought my friends, K through fifth grades in here. So elementary friends, are you ready to celebrate today? Let me hear you. Okay, I need a little wooing. We got the clappers. That was good. There we go. There we go. Okay, so we are ready. So I want to tell you, friends, about my friend Gabby, who we get to baptize today. So Gabby Krupa, there she is. <laughs> she is an eight-year-old who just finished second grade on Friday. Yes, I know, shout out, she's a big third grader now. Now Gabby, um, she has, ever since the pandemic hit, Gabby has been watching Ascent Kids online. And this is a place where Gabby consistently was getting to see and hear content designed for her and to hear about the love of Jesus. And so through the pandemic and through a move for the past three plus years, Gabby has been faithfully watching Ascent Kids online. Well, about a month ago, Gabby watched somebody else get baptized and she was inspired. So she told her mom, I love Jesus, I want to follow Jesus, and I want to get baptized too. And so as Gabby asked the question, her mom paid attention, and Gabby kept asking about baptism. She was pretty persistent about her ask. And her mom, Lindsay, she told us, this wasn't just like an ask, a thought that came and went, no, Gabby was persistent and she was serious about baptism. So Lindsay reached out to us. And um, here we are today. We get to celebrate Gabby's decision. Yes, that is amazing. So I want to say thank you to all of you. If you are someone who gives at Ascent, 
It is your generosity that has helped build the faith of Gabby and has helped make Jesus accessible to the next generation. And it's your generosity that makes Ascent Kids and Ascent Kids Online possible. So thank you for partnering with us. Thank you for your generosity. We're so grateful. And so today, we get to celebrate and help Gabby take a next step in her faith, and we get to celebrate the life change um, in her life. Gabby told me, I believe that Jesus has died for my sins. And when I told her, I said, tell me why you've been so excited about baptism and why you were persistent about that. And she said, I want to tell the world that Jesus died for our sins and I don't want to wait. <laughs> Friends, that will preach, right? That's so good. <laughs> I love it. I was like, Gabby, I cannot wait for you to share that with other people this Sunday. You are a bright light, and we're excited to celebrate. And so you get to tell the world today about your belief in Jesus, and we're so grateful. So, all right, friends, here we go. So Gabby, would you, and actually, let me tell you this. So Gabby, this is her first time back in our building since COVID. So as you get ready to celebrate, and as Gabby and her friends and family meet me down here at the pool, would you give them a warm welcome back to Ascent? Sorry, I got to ditch the coat. Okay, Gabby, come back here with me. All right, friends, this is Gabby. Say hello to Gabby. All right, so here is your job. When Gabby goes under the water, that's her symbolizing saying that she believes that Jesus died on the cross for her sins, right? And when she comes back up out of the water, that's her saying that she believes that Jesus rose from the grave, that he is alive and he is her Lord and Savior. And that is your cue, friends. Church, come on. When she comes up out of that water, I need you to cheer her on like nobody's business. All right? Can you do that, friends? All right. So, Gabby, let me help you in. face this way. There we go. Okay. Gabby, you are joyful and you are confident and you radiate the love of Jesus. And we're so excited to celebrate with you today. We're so proud of you. And I pray that you will always be a bright light for Jesus, for all those around you, and that you will always know his great love for you. So today, it's my honor and my privilege to baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Oh, man, what a great celebration. You know, when I think about uh, a moment that symbolizes a per particular trajectory in life, it is baptism that sets you on the course. Gabby, look up here for a moment. Congratulations. We are so proud of you. Way to go. We give, her, give her lots of love and appreciation. <laughs> Well, good morning, friends. Good to be with you. How is, every, how is everybody in the building, okay? I got a thumbs up for my friend Jeremy over there. I'll take that, Jeremy. I see you over there. Don't think I don't see you. And um, I am thrilled to be here this morning. My name is John. For those of you who don't know me, and I am the discipleship pastor here at Ascent, and I get to be in relationship with lots of different people and I find such great joy in being here in this space with you. If you are watching at home, welcome. Hey, this morning, we're going to dive back into our journey through the book of Ephesians. And we're going to do something a little bit differently this morning. So I'm going to ask for some participation from all of you. So I'm going to ask you for engagement. We're going to do a practice together. And then we're actually going to have a time of reflection as we move through this particular letter. So this is our third week. 
in Ephesians, and we're going to spend some time in chapter 2 of Ephesians as we move through this story together. And if you look at the letter as a whole, what you will notice is that Paul, the person who's writing this particular letter, keeps pressing this issue of unity and oneness. And when I think about unity and I think about oneness, I can rally behind the idea of unity and oneness. And I think we can get really excited around the concept of unity. We love the idea of it. It's the practice of unity where it gets really difficult and the implementation of it. So when I think about unity, there's some images and words that come up in my mind. And this morning what we're going to do is we're going to be working from this iPad. And as I'm working with the iPad, I'm going to disappear from the screen. So those of you who are at home, uh, for a few moments throughout the sermon, you're going to see me disappear, and this is going to come up on the screen, and we're going to work together through the iPad. So I, I wrote down some things that I thought would be helpful around the idea of unity, and then this other idea of uniformity. And I think what we experience many times in communities like this is we experience uniformity. Unity celebrates differences. So if I could um, get that first screen up there. Unity, we think about the idea of celebrating differences. There's a true celebration. Whereas uniform, uniformity has to do with affinity, sameness. We think of unity as embracing all cultures. We're not asking people to leave their culture at the door, but bring your culture into the table, into the expression of who you are as a person. And whereas uniformity seems to be centered around clubs, and we like this idea of being in clubs with people who think like us, act like us, see reality like us. In unity, we are great at holding tension together. Whereas in uniformity, we have language, specific language that we use. And I think particularly around religious systems, you'll go into a religious system and they'll use particular kinds of language. And you're like, what are these people talking about as if it's a different language? And then we expect people just to figure it out. And we think about unity as curiosity. We come into space with one another with an openness and a curiosity, wondering what the other person might bring into the discussion and into the relationship. And in uniformity, there's like a sense of tribalistic approach to life. We experience this tribalism where we get completely ingrained in how we experience things in sameness. Again, unity is rooted in abundance, whereas uniformity, I think, is rooted in scarcity. Unity is rooted that there's enough room for everyone. Everybody's included, whereas in uniformity, we ask you to think like us. And if you don't think like us, then you're out. So we hold that tension within unity. In unity, there's only us. We don't see thems. We see us as a whole, as a picture. In unity, we get the idea of letting go, opening ourselves and surrendering. And in uniformity, there's a, a tight gripness that comes we want things to be a certain way. We want to control outcomes. And in unity, there's a sense of freedom and flow. And in uniformity, there's like fear of the other and a clogging that happens in that flow. So as we step into this letter this morning, into this idea of oneness, connectedness, I'm going to ask you a couple of questions to open up with. And then as we land today, we're going to land with a couple of the same questions. So the questions that I want to pose, bring out for you this morning are two. Number one, in what ways am I participating in building walls between me and people? Division. In what ways am I building walls in relationships? And the second question is, what are the next steps that I'm going to take to help build and take down those walls, to tear them down and start making moves towards humanity and not away from humanity. So this idea of oneness is rooted in a story. And I want to begin by reading Ephesians chapter 2, verses 13 through 16. So if you'll turn your attention to the screen for a moment, we're going to read through a portion of this letter. And Paul is writing this letter to a group of Jesus followers in the city of Ephesus. So let's begin by reading. But now, in Christ Jesus, you. Just stop there for a moment. When you see the word Christ Jesus, I want you to put in place there, Christ means Messiah or it means King. So Israel's long-awaited Messiah, the one that's going to put everything back into the right, Jesus takes on this role of being the Christ. He's the Messiah 
or the king. So when you read a passage like this, you can read it as Jesus, in, in Messiah Jesus, or in King Jesus, you. And what Paul is talking to about the you is all non-Jews, Gentiles. So when he talks about you, he's not talking about Jews, he's talking about you, Gentiles, the whole together. You who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ, for he is our peace. In his flesh, he has made both groups into one, Jew and Gentile, and has broken down the dividing wall, that is, the hostility between us. He has abolished the law with its commandments and ordinances that he might create in himself one new humanity in place of the two, thus making peace, and might reconcile both groups to God in one body through the cross, thus putting to death that hostility through it. So when we look at a passage like this, the first question that we ask is, where is Paul getting these ideas? Where is he pulling this idea of oneness from? When he talks about unity, one new family, one new humanity, what is he pulling from? Because the New Testament writers are always pulling from a bigger story. These are not things that you're just making up in the moment. They're pulling from a bigger narrative. So the best way for us to honor the text and understand the text is to step into the big story of God. Now, as we step into the big story of God, I want to throw out one more invitation for us this morning. If you are here this morning and you feel a stirring, you feel a sense of like, I want to jump in that tub and get baptized. After the gathering this morning, I'm going to be over here after I preach off to this side of the room. If you want to come on up and let me know, I want to be baptized this morning. We want to make space for you. That water is 99 degrees. It's really comfortable. And we would love to celebrate with you. So we want to do impromptu celebration with us this morning. So we want to create space for the Spirit of God to work in our lives in this moment, understanding the assumption that God is always at work. God is always stirring in people's lives and in people's hearts. And we trust that and we lean into that. So open your heart and listen to what God's gentle whisper might be saying to you this morning. Now, we're going to jump into God's big story for a moment, and I'm going to draw some things out for us as we look at the grand narrative, the big story of God. So let's begin. We start with humanity. So humans, image bearers is what it says in Genesis chapter 1. And in Genesis chapter 1, God makes this declaration over humanity, that humanity is created in the image and likeness of God. So we start in the story as image bearers. And even in Genesis, it says, let us make humans in our image. So again, there's that us language, let us make humanity like us. And so out of that goodness and out of that flow, God begins to speak into the chaos and he begins to bring order and then he makes a declaration over humanity. Humanity is good because humanity is connected with God. So there's oneness, there's flow. It even says in Genesis that God would come down into the garden in the cool of the day, in the evening, and he would walk with humanity. And it says that he would co-create with humanity, giving them particular roles, like naming the animals. And so we see this participation between God and humans, and we would refer to humanity as co-creators with God. That's their original role. And if we think about humans and the face that they would make, we would say, this is the face of humanity. Right? Happy face, green, life, co-creation, connection. But two pages into the story, something catastrophic happens, and what we experience is what I would call a cosmic explosion. And in Genesis chapter 3, humanity makes a conscious decision to go out on their own and begin managing their own lives. So humans come under new management and they step away, they disconnect from the creator and move away from God in that co-creation process 
and they began to take matters into their own hands. And then between Genesis 3 and Genesis 11, there are four acts that I think define the human experience and human existence. And in Act 1, we see these two characters, these stand-ins for humanity, Adam and Eve. The moment they decide to step out on their own, they begin to experience some things inside of their very being and soul. And one of the first things that they begin to experience and begin to practice is what I would call the art of denial. How many of you have participated in the art of denial, by the way? Pretty good at it? Then we move into blame, right? It's not my fault. It's their fault. We love to blame. We see that. I think we see that in the world today, right? Shame seeking concealment. Shame enters into the human narrative. We do our best to conceal those parts of us that we don't want people to see out of embarrassment or humiliation. And so we create devices to cover ourselves from allowing other people to see the parts of us that we're ashamed of. Act two, this is chapter four of Genesis. These two other characters step into the story, Cain and Abel, the kids of Adam and Eve, and Cain and Abel, brothers, violence enters the human narrative. And instead of dealing with his anger towards God, Cain takes out his anger towards God on his brother, ends up killing his brother. God comes to him and says, where's your brother? And what is the response? Am I my brother's keeper, right? He takes control over his idea of justice, how to deal with anger, refuses to look inside of himself, and steps away from that divine order of connection. So again, humanity and the divide starts to get further and further apart. Four chapters in. Act three, Noah. Oh, Noah. We think of Noah as this heroic figure where God comes to this one righteous person in humanity and says, Noah, I'm going to wipe out humanity and send a flood, and I want you to build a boat to save human existence. And so Noah, instead of pleading on behalf of humanity, Noah shirks responsibility busies himself in his work, moves away from humanity and says, you know what, good riddance with humanity. It's just me and my family. And he builds a boat. And I would refer to this as a shirking of responsibility. Okay? Fourth act, the Tower of Babel. The Tower of Babel is humans' very attempt at building a tower all the way up to the heavens to touch God, to bring heaven to earth. And in an attempt to bring order out of chaos, what they do instead is they enter into chaos and they bring more chaos into the world. And now we have division and us versus them. And in a touch of irony, the text tells us that God made a decision to come down and see what these humans were doing. They were making a a tower to touch God. And God's like, the tower is so small, I actually have to come down to look at it. So God's not impressed with the human effort. Humanity steps away from responsibility. And now we have all of this chaos, all of these fragments moving throughout the world and brokenness and decay. So let's just sit in that for a moment. We think about the story. I think what happens with humanity in this moment, that humanity begins with the statement, let us make humanity in our image. Humanity, in an attempt to move out on their own, decides to take that narrative back to themselves. And what they say is, let us make God in our image. And that's the human experience. And so now when we look at humanity, we see all of these broken fragments, thousands of different pieces in the human story that all came out of chapters 3 through 11 of this brokenness that we see in human existence and in the human story. So let's fly up a bit more. Let's go up to about 30,000 feet. That's like a nice cruising altitude, right? We'll fly up to about 30,000 feet 
and we'll step into this story because what God does is God says, okay, I see all of the chaos, I see the brokenness, but I'm going to refuse to allow this to be the narrative. God steps into the story and says, I'm going to do something redemptive through humanity, through these co-creators that decided to go out on their own. And then we get to the next screen. We see a people who are born into existence. And in Genesis chapter 12, a people are born, and through this couple, Abraham and Sarah, God says, I'm going to do something redemptive through your family line. Through your family is going to come a seed, and that seed is going to be the seed that's going to restore all of these broken relationships and the broken communication that happened from Genesis 3 to Genesis 11. God doesn't leave humanity on its own device, steps into the narrative, into the story, and begins doing something redemptive. And he says, my people are born. And then he gives to the people a mandate and says, you are to be a healing presence in all the world. You're going to restore the nations. You're going to bring people back into wholeness. There's that idea of oneness and unity again. And everybody is going to be blessed through your family line. So healing, light, connection, oneness comes through Genesis chapter 12. And then we get to Torah. And Torah are the first five books of the Old Testament, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. And God gives the people the law. And the reason why God gives people the law is he says, you will be my people and I will be your God. If I introduced Shannon to you and said, ladies and gentlemen, this is Shannon, and you didn't know me, what would that mean to you? You'd be like, well, we really don't know who Shannon is. Is she a friend? Is she special in your life? Yes. If I said to you, this is my Shannon, that would imply something different. You might be able to connect the dots because you seem like a sharp group of people. <laughs> this is my Shannon which means I'm in a relationship with her that sets us apart. There's something unique going on in our relationship. We just celebrated our 33rd year together as a couple, right? Last Friday. That's my Shannon. So I will be your God. You will be my people and I will be your God. And so God gives them the law. And he gives them the law because he's a relational God. And within the law, they took out, according to Jewish tradition, they pulled out over 613 different commandments. Now imagine trying to manage that. 613. Woo! That's a lot. That's a lot of work. They would refer to Torah as, and maybe this will sound familiar to you, the way, the truth, and the life. That's a nod to Jesus, by the way. Torah, given as a full expression of divine order, and that through your family is going to come the seed that's going to restore my people and restore the earth and bring us back into radical oneness. Now, we're flying at 30,000 feet. Let's come down a little bit lower, and I'm going to jump through the whole story of the Old Testament and right into the New Testament. Jesus enters the story, and as Jesus enters the story... People are asking the question of this rabbi, is this Israel's long-awaited king? Is he the one? Is he the one that we've been waiting for? Is he the one that's come through that redemptive line, that yellow line that's going to lead us back to wholeness, to connection? Is he the one? So everybody's asking the question. And when Jesus steps into the story, he bumps up against tons of barriers, resistance, and he begins calling all of the scattered children of Israel back together. He's going out into the obsolete places and he's calling people back into wholeness and connection with God. Doing that work of fulfilling the law. Doing the work of what Israel was intended to be in the world. Jesus steps into the world and says, we are light in this world. Going back to the original call. And he begins calling people back together together. But he keeps bumping up against the religious leaders and religious systems. Because that's what systems do. They create barriers. So Jesus bumps up against 
three, I think three main obstacles that he continues to bump up against. And it seems like they've taken these 613 commandments and whittled it down into three. And as they're moving against these three obstacles, the one that I can see in the narratives of Jesus' story are centered around Sabbath. There's all these rules and regulations around Sabbath, that one day a week that we're supposed to keep separate and celebrate, but they turned it into something else where it's actually taking people's lives and taking the joy. And so Jesus bumps up against Sabbath. And then the other one we see is all these rules and regulations around dietary restrictions and who's clean and unclean. And Paul bumps up against that later in the story that we're going to discover in the book of Ephesians. And it's all of these bumping up against these system, who's in, who's out, creating this massive division. And then the third one that I see is all around the temple. And the temple is the place where God comes down and dwells with humanity. And in, and in an attempt to bring people in, Paul keeps bumping up against this system. Because Paul is insistent that Gentiles are now included in God's big family through Jesus. And as Paul brings Greeks into the temple, they tick off the Jews. And now you have all of these divisions and this hostility and this brokenness. You can read about that in Acts chapter 21. It's an interesting story. And it's the reason why Paul is in prison as he's writing this letter to the group in Ephesus. So Paul and Jesus bumping up against these barriers. Now what we're going to do this morning is you're going to notice that people are going to start building barriers down the center aisles. Don't worry. This is just part of the whole deal this morning. So I'm going to invite my barrier builders to come in and start building walls of division down the lines. And I want to address, as we're doing this, I want to talk about four different sects of humanity or Jewish expression in the time of Jesus. So during the time of Jesus, there are four different sects of Judaism that are expressing themselves in the story. And Jesus keeps bumping up against these systems. So there's four sections in the room. You're all going to play roles. And I want to be clear that these are not villains in the story. Each of these groups are doing their best to obey the law and to participate in obedience to the Torah. They're doing their absolute best. So no villains in the story. So over here, welcome this section of the room. You are what we call the Essenes, beloved Essenes. You're like the desert people, okay? You have decided that you want to separate yourselves from culture because culture is evil. And so you move to the outskirts of society, do your practices, and you separate yourselves from culture because you don't want to give yourself over to an evil and idolatrous nation. So separateness. In this section of the room, you are the beloved Herodians. Welcome, Herodians. It's nice to see you this morning. And the Herodians have made a conscious decision that they're going to fall under into the political system. So you're highly political people. You didn't even know it, but here you are in this section. Herod, the puppet master, appointed by Rome, is Jewish. He's our guy. So according to you, why fight the system? Why not just work within the system and we can create goodness and wholeness in the world? But you got to play the game. So now we have the Herodians. Then we get to our beloved Pharisees, this section which seems to be the fullest section in the room. That's fantastic. <laughs> Pharisees. You guys get such a bad rap, but you're really not bad people. You want to obey the law. You want to hold to it. You love Torah. You love God. You're devout. You get a little ridiculous sometimes, but you love God. And we see that in you. So the Pharisees believe that through our obedience, God is actually going to send the Messiah back into humanity's story. So if we're radically obedient, the Messiah will come. So congratulations to you. And then over here, I got to keep these people all the way over here because these are the zealots. And the zealots get a little rough. Zealots, like, let's raise up a military. Let's go in and slit some Roman throats. Let's get the band back together and make this thing sing. Right? We got our guy. Jesus is our guy. And back in the Old Testament narrative, God led us into great battles. So why not, zealots, let's go do this together. This is why I keep you over here. <laughs> so the Essenes see this Jesus come into the story, and they're asking the question, is Jesus anything like us? Is he like us? And they're watching Jesus, and then they see Jesus go into culture, 
He actually takes the disciples to the gates of hell in Caesarea Philippi. There's a lot of nonsense that goes on there. And Jews don't go to those spaces. He even takes them over to the other side of the sea and meets a demon-possessed man because that's what happens when you go to the other side of the sea. And Jesus is engaging with culture and he's engaging with all different kinds of people. So he's not an Essene. John the Baptist might have been an Essene. But Jesus doesn't. He doesn't quite fit the role. Herodians, you're looking at Jesus. He gives his inaugural speech. And what does he say? The kingdom of God is here. And you're like, he's th he just threw down the gauntlet. You don't say that when there's an already established kingdom in the system. So he can't be like us. And then Pharisees are looking at Jesus and they're going, is he anything like us? Well, he loves Torah. He's a great teacher. But then he shows up at a party and he takes water and turns it into the wine and people get drunk. So he certainly can't be a Pharisee. He's out. And then the zealots. Oh, beloved zealots. This has got to be it, right? He's got to be a zealot. And then Peter, one of his own, takes up a sword, cuts off a guy's ear, and Jesus says, put your sword down. That's not what we're about. And then when he's preaching on a mountainside one day, he says, blessed are the poor, blessed are the meek, blessed are the peacemakers. And zealots are like, yeah, he's not like us. <laughs> so we're out. So when we ask the wrong questions, we arrive at the wrong conclusions. And the question that we all need to be asking, friends, is are we anything like Jesus? And are we making God in our image or have we submitted to the reality that we've been created in his image? And it's not the other way around. We want him to fit into our way of reality, into our systems, into our viewpoints. And at best, we want to start practicing uniformity. But what Jesus calls us to, and what Paul calls us to, and what Paul invites us into is unity and oneness. So we go back to the screen for a moment, and we see the radical life of Jesus. And Jesus keeps clashing against Rome. He crashes against the Jewish nation. And all of this chaos between Rome and Jew and Gentile and us versus them all of the narratives that come from Genesis chapter 3, Jesus goes to the cross, and the cross is literally a Roman symbol of execution. And in an act of absorption, Jesus takes all of humanity. He takes all of the chaos, and it gets absorbed on him on the cross. And then the question comes up. Among all of these different groups of people that have been following Jesus, is it game over? Is that it? We gave our life for that? And then Jesus breaks death, he breaks the curse, and he resurrects. And resurrection leads us back to life. And then we get to the next screen and we see that yellow line, that Jesus resurrection. And then Paul starts talking about this narrative, which Maurice led us into last week, that in Christ, when we place our faith and our trust in Jesus, we experience the redemptiveness of the plan of God. And he restores humanity and then we are actually rooted in Christ, which Bill led us through last week. And then in Christ, we become the church. And Paul says the church is a new family based on unity and connection. Paul says that we are a new humanity where the two have become one. And then Paul keeps referring to us as new creation, taking us back to the Genesis 1 narrative. And the church's role moves from this space. If we see the whole story, that cosmic explosion in Genesis 12, and then we see the people of God who continue to be unfaithful, and yet God remains faithful. And then Jesus steps into the story, and Jesus takes all of that 
brokenness and chaos and all of those fragmented pieces, and it's absorbed on the cross, but the cross can't keep him down, and so he rises from the dead, he resurrects, and then Paul says, in Jesus, in this new creation, we become the living, breathing presence of God in the world. And Paul says we are the church. And now our role, those of us who have said yes to Jesus, we get to heal. We get to be a healing presence in the world. We get to be co-creators with God. We go back to that original intent in Genesis 1. We get to reconcile. We get to practice reconciliation. We get to restore. And then in this beautiful explanation of what it's all about, Paul says in Ephesians 2, 19 through 22, so then, you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are citizens. Oh, that's great language. With the saints and also members of the household of God, built upon the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, with Christ Jesus, King Jesus himself as the cornerstone. In him, in Christ, the whole structure is joined together and grows into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you are also built together spiritually into a dwelling place for God. And what he does here is absolutely amazing. He says, now you who are in Christ are the living, breathing, walking, life-giving temple of God. He's moved out of the building, ladies and gentlemen. Jesus has left the building. And now he lives in us and breathes in us. And we are the living, walking building representation of God's presence in the world. We are taking down the walls of division. So what I'm going to ask you to do this morning, Essenes, Herodians, can you get along? Pharisees, you guys make it really difficult. But can you get along? Maybe with Essenes, not sure about zealots. But would you step up from your seats for a moment? Those of you in the room who are sitting in this going, I've actually participated in building some walls between me and so-and-so, between a conservative and a liberal, between this person and this person in my family. And can you make a move? So I'm going to ask you, zealots, Pharisees, Herodians, Essenes, if a few of you would get out of your seats, take these walls of division down, place them in the front, place them in the back, let's tear down the walls of division. So get up and do it if you feel the urge to do so. Practice. Let's take a moment, and I just want you to close your eyes if that helps you center. And think about the implications of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Think about what he's inviting us into, to bring people together. That's what we get to do as co-creators. So Jesus... We invite you to enter into this space with us for a moment. And if there are areas inside of each one of us, areas inside of me, where I have participated in division because of the way I see people or the way I react to people, help me to restore my vision of what that might look like. And help me to make the next move to tear down walls of division and to begin opening up relational connection points once again. Not to see people as their political affiliation, but to see them as image bearers created in your likeness, in your image, as life givers in the world. Help us to lay down aside our own agendas and our own sense of sameness and likeness and tribalism that exists in all of us and help us lean into the expressive power of joining together with humanity in the enjoyment of relational connection. And help us, Jesus, help us to be a healing presence in this world. Help us to be a healing presence in the front range of Colorado. To live into our expression of for the good of our city, for the good of all cities in this area. 
for the good created as image bearers. Help us to step into that healing space. Guide us now. In the name of Jesus, we pray these things. Amen.